Good day, everyone. Welcome to another one of our midweek Bible studies. I apologize for last week. Um, my computer died unexpectedly, and so um, I didn't have any of my settings or anything uh, ready to go. So uh, we'll pick this up uh, this week, and we'll be looking at the book of 2 Corinthians. Now, um, the second of two letters that Paul sent to the church in Corinth. And so uh, let's get to the uh, slides, and um, we'll work on this. So here is a an overview of the Corinthian church. The historical background for this letter is going to be the same as 1 Corinthians. So if you want to go back and review that, you certainly can. Um, it would be helpful for what we're doing um, here in 2 Corinthians, we are still dealing with a church in a very diverse, uh, very successful and wealthy city. Uh, and this church has the same troubles and divisions as before, presumably, although hopefully uh, the first letter to the Corinthians addressed, maybe solved some of those issues. Uh, most commentators believe that the second letter to the Corinthians was written about a year after 1 Corinthians. And we'll go over the sort of timetable that we think um, these letters were written in and what Paul was doing um, with the Corinthians in his correspondence. Um, first of all, let's look at um, 2 Corinthians. Uh, this is a sequel of sorts. Um, it has the same background concerns, the same sort of style as 1 Corinthians. But um, it's very different. Uh, while 1 Corinthians was arranged pretty neatly by topic, and you had one section kind of flowing into the next, okay? You had a uh, discussion of sexual immorality. It kind of flowed right into Paul's teaching on marriage and what it should be. Um, you had the discussion on spiritual gifts and the body of Christ, and that led right into his discussion of love as the greatest thing to pursue. And so uh, 1 Corinthians kind of really neatly um, arranged and again, you know, kind of flowing in between topics, you know, one into the next. 2 Corinthians, it's a little bit more haphazard. Uh, Paul kind of jumps around, he wanders in his thoughts, um, he goes from theme to theme. Um, and it, yeah, just a little bit more uh, haphazard and not as uh, precisely organized as 1 Corinthians. Uh, many commentators even think that um, this letter that we call 2 Corinthians may actually be two or more letters kind of stuck together. Um, somebody after maybe after Paul's death uh, got together a bunch of these smaller letters that he sent to the Corinthians and just kind of stuck them all together and into one uh, collection called 2 Corinthians. In particular, um, some have pointed to this really clear abrupt break between chapters 9 and 10 and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, as evidence that you know, chapters 10 through 13 uh, may be one of these harsh letters that Paul refers to in um, chapter 2 verse 4 and chapter 7 verse 8. You know, he makes reference to this other letter that he had to send uh, before the main body of 2 Corinthians. And um, many scholars actually believe that chapters 10 through 13 might be that letter. Okay. Uh, in fact, by carefully reading um, these two letters to the Corinthians, um, we can construct a probable timeline of Paul's dealings with the Corinthians. So in the early 50s, uh, Paul founded the Corinthian church, uh, maybe between 50 and 53. And uh, we have the story of how that happened in Acts chapter 18. It says Paul came to the city and he found this couple that he was familiar with, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and he stayed with them and he stayed in the city for some time, we think maybe as long as 18 months, that he first uh, stayed in the city on his first visit and he fa actually founded the Corinthian church during this stay. Uh, at some point uh, in Acts 18 verse 18, it says he left the city of Corinth to continue on in his journey. Um, and uh, then he ended up going to the city of Ephesus over in Asia Minor, what we call now call Turkey. 
when he was in in Ephesus, um, maybe again, maybe, maybe a few months after he left, he received some troubling reports of what was happening in the church, and um, this prompted Paul to write First Corinthians. And when we talked about First Corinthians a couple of weeks ago, we looked at some of those problems. Um, some very large problems in the church. Right? If you remember division, um, immorality, lots of problems going on in the church. And so Paul got alarmed at this, and then he wrote 1 Corinthians in response to these reports. Apparently some of the Corinthians had written a letter to Paul, and we have Paul's response to some of those points in that letter in 1 Corinthians. We have no idea what was in the letter that they sent to him, but we do know that Paul kind of references that letter when he is giving some of his teachings and advice. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 11, he makes reference to a report that was delivered to him by some of Chloe's people. Uh, Chloe, apparently a very prominent woman in the church, um, who uh, came with a delegation maybe of people or sent some people uh, to visit Paul in Ephesus and um, they told him about some of this stuff that was happening. So Paul writes 1 Corinthians in response to these reports and in um, 1 Corinthians he promised that he would visit um, Corinth after traveling to Macedonia. At the very end of 1 Corinthians he says, I'll, I'm going to pay you a visit um, after I go to Macedonia. He intended, apparently, to stay for some time uh, during this visit. But we find out in 2 Corinthians that um, Paul actually changed his plans. Okay? In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says that he ended up visiting Corinth before he went to Macedonia. And maybe this caught them by surprise. Uh, maybe they weren't entirely ready for him. But we learn in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, um, that his visit did not go well. Okay, um, Paul calls it a painful visit in chapter 2, verse 1. Um, in chapter 2, verse 5, it seems that someone in the church did something to offend Paul. And um, he frames it as causing pain to himself, but also to the entire congregation. Um, whatever the case, whatever happened here, um, yeah, this visit did not go as he had hoped. It didn't go well, and it seems that in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul canceled his plans to visit again on his return from Macedonia. He said, I wanted to visit you twice because I thought this would be a good thing. But then when he came back, uh, when he finished up in Macedonia after visiting the Corinthians, he decided not to visit them again. And um, this caused more tensions. Okay? Um, it, we think that um, this is what Paul was referring to in chapter 1, verse 17, where he's talking about um, you know, his visits, he, he says things like, am I, you know, do you think that I'm unreliable? Do you think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I think the word that in my Bible translation is used is vacillating, okay, kind of going back and forth. He, Corinthians were saying, hey, maybe you can't make up your mind. You know, you said you were coming after Macedonia, you came before, you surprised us, and then you said you were coming afterwards and you didn't. So what's going on? Right? And so Paul um, wrote this letter in, in response to some of this stuff. He, he makes reference to this in, in 2 Corinthians. All right Now, after this, Paul wrote another letter, and this is what we call the severe letter. Um, he, he wrote this letter, and in his mind, apparently, he, this is his wording, okay? This is not the Corinthians' wording. But Paul refers to this letter as kind of the severe letter or the strict letter. And he says that it caused him a lot of pain to write this. And um, he even regretted sending it. Okay, um, So, yeah, you know, this was not a fun letter to either write or read. Um, but as I noted before, uh, this letter has either been lost or it may have been included in the last few chapters of what we now know as 2 Corinthians. Um, we know that Paul wrote this letter out of some level of desperation, and um, he does indicate in 
chapter 7, verse 8 of 2 Corinthians, that he actually regretted sending it. Um, now, around the time of this severe letter, Paul and his companions also had things going on in their own lives. Uh, they experienced a terrible affliction that he writes about in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is verses 8 through 11. He says he experienced some kind of great affliction in Asia. When he mentions Asia, this is not like China, Korea, Thailand. Okay, uh, This is talking about the Roman province that is now called Turkey. Um, this is where Ephesus was. And uh, Paul did a lot of work and he stayed a lot in Ephesus but we do know from um, from Acts and some other New Testament writings that uh, they had some problems in Ephesus um, and so this might be what he is pointing to here in 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 all right they have, they experienced some kind of great affliction persecution and maybe after this affliction Paul kind of changed his mind he kind of changed his demeanor towards ministry okay uh, maybe it softened him a little bit um, or maybe hearing about this affliction actually softened the corinthians hearts towards paul um, you remember after the visit that he paid them things were not going well and there was lots of tension and um, discomfort between them in this relationship well maybe they heard you know that paul was having a lot of problems and and a persecution he might have even been thrown into prison in Ephesus and so the Corinthians may have heard about this and they you know kind of felt bad for him uh, you know they they I'd imagine you know that they they prayed for him a lot whatever happened here um, with this affliction you know whether it changed Paul's heart or it changed the Corinthians heart we know that in 2nd Corinthians chapter 7 the situation had improved a great deal um, in chapter 7, verse 6, Paul says that uh, Titus came, uh, and he met with Paul, and he brought good news. Um, the Corinthians had repented of, of uh, the misdeeds that they had done, and from Paul's perspective, his relationship with the church was restored. That's in um, chapter 7, verse 16. He says, you know, that... that I've been restored to you and, and I, I have confidence my confidence in you has been restored uh, Paul's joy and his relief at this turn of events led him to write the letter that we now know as 2nd Corinthians at least chapters 1 through 9 now strangely enough after this joy and relief of chapter 7 um, where Paul is talking about repentance and reconciliation, we get to chapters 8 and 9 where he's doing um, you know, a lot of this fundraising. He's trying to raise some funds uh, to support the churches in other places. Um, and you know, he seems to be pretty confident about this. He's asking them for money, which is not something you typically do when you're having tension with people. So, um, yeah, you know, chapter 7, we get reconciliation. Chapters 8 and 9, he's trying to uh, raise these funds and uh, generate enthusiasm and support for his ministry. Chapter 10 is that big break that I mentioned. Okay, chapter 10 switches to the situation that had arisen some time before the composition of 2 Corinthians. What we have here, this might be, again, this severe letter that he had to write. Uh, the tone of these chapters is considerably more aggressive and defensive than um, the rest of the letter. And so this is why a lot of scholars think that this might be that severe letter, and it might have just gotten bundled up when um, this letter became part of the Bible, at least for Christians. Okay, uh, but what we, what we have here in um, the last part of Second Corinthians is this group of people whom Paul refers to, and and when he uses this language, it's probably sarcastic. Um, it, it's this conflict with this group of people known as the super apostles. Again, Paul's language, Paul's kind of uh, label for this group of people. Uh, this group of super apostles had arrived in Corinth and they were active among the church. Um, we have no idea about how many of these super apostles there were. Um, probably a small group of um, 
of a like this apostolic team, just like Paul had, right? Paul was traveling around with um, Silas and Timothy and Titus. Um, maybe, yeah, you know, the same kind of situation. Um, a handful of people that are traveling around and um, finding space in these churches where they're starting to teach and preach. Uh, this was not good news for Paul. Okay, um, he he did not appreciate these people. Uh, Paul mentions in chapter eleven of Second Corinthians, uh, this is eleven twenty two, that um, the super apostles were Hebrews, so like Paul, um, Jewish Christians, and in verse twenty three, um, he does say that they are ministers of Christ. At least they portray themselves to be ministers of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians does reveal that there were these serious conflicts between these apostles and Paul. Uh, Paul, again, because of the rest of uh, what he says in chapters 10 through 13, we think that when he calls them the super apostles, this is um, being sarcastic. It's kind of, you know, um, oh yeah, you know, they're the super apostles. That's what they think about themselves. Okay, And... Um, Paul goes so far as to call these people ministers of Satan disguised as ministers of righteousness. All right, not a lot of uh, mutual love and respect between Paul and this group of people. So this strange switch in tone and content is what has led some commentators to believe that um, chapters 10 through 13 are this separate severe letter. Um, and you know it, it's a fairly convincing argument to me. Uh, there is this clear break between chapters nine and ten, and it doesn't seem like chapters ten through thirteen have a whole lot to do with what Paul is talking about in uh, chapters one through nine. It's very strange, you know, that if he was having this major conflict with these people, that he would wait until chapter ten to kind of introduce this. Um, on the other hand. Um, all of the textual evidence that we have suggests that 2 Corinthians is a single letter. Okay, the problem with this theory of two letters being uh, kind of squished together is that there's, there's simply no evidence that we have that 2 Corinthians ever existed as separate letters. Uh, there's nothing in the textual history to say you know, that chapters 1 through 9 existed as separate from chapters 10 through 13, and later they kind of put them together. Um, it's entirely from these kinds of close readings that suggest that this may have been more than one letter, but we can't really be be sure. If you just take um, the manuscripts, the way that the text has been communicated to us, um, Second Corinthians is one um, full contained letter. Okay, uh, but yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of evidence both ways, and so you know, it, I, I I'm not sure that it's that important, um, but just something kind of interesting to note, and that, yeah, we may have two or even more letters here, and so the relationship and the correspondence might have been a lot more complicated than, you know, Paul gets a letter and he sends 1 Corinthians, then he gets some other information, and then he sends 2 Corinthians. So what, what are the major things to look for as as sort of you read through Second Corinthians, now uh, keep in mind um, the history between Paul and this church. Um, he was the founder; uh, he founded the church, and there's obviously this very strong connection between um, Paul and the Corinthians. Um, and one of the important themes in Second Corinthians is Paul's treatment of his own ministry. If you remember now um, this deep connection has kind of been severed or it hasn't been severed but it's been really tested it's been strained and so a lot of second corinthians is paul kind of defending his ministry but really uh talking about what his uh, you know what his goals what his motivations are um, in this relationship with the corinthians um in large part due to the nature of this church, you know how how uh, divided they are, all the all the problems that they're having. Uh, Paul has been putting a lot of effort into this, um, but then he also 
you know, kind of, he has to acknowledge that, yeah, you know, uh, things have been kind of stormy, things have been kind of strained between us. Now, um, once you know about this background, it's impossible not to see it in this letter. All right, 2 Corinthians may be Paul's most personal, intimate, and certainly the most vulnerable letter. Um, he, he's going into great detail about his ministry. Um, he is emphasizing how much he has tried to model integrity and virtue. In uh, chapter 7, verse 2, he, he really hits this. You know, um, he's, he's wanted to be sincere. He's wanted to show them um, kind of to be a, um, what, an example to them. In chapter 1, verse 12, um, he says, Indeed, this is our boast, uh, the testimony of our conscience. Uh, we have behaved in the world with frankness and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and all the more toward you. All right, so um, establishing that, or maybe even re-establishing that, you know, that, that his motives are pure, he wanted to be sincere, um, he was always looking out for the Corinthians' welfare. Um, he stresses his deep love for the Corinthians, even when he is rebuking them. Um, this is a love that is shared between Paul and the church, and he wants to remind that of them, even when he is having to tell them things that are maybe coming across as harsh or difficult. Um, in chapter 2, verse 4, he says, you know, that, hey, you're my people, and when you're suffering, I'm suffering too. Now, another important theme in 2 Corinthians is this discussion of apostolic authority. And this, is, uh, this comes out most in this dispute between Paul and the super apostles in chapters 10 through 12. This dispute is mostly centered on apostolic authority. Uh, we don't know a lot about what the super apostles were teaching, but apparently the conflict wasn't really on doctrine and belief. It was about who has the authority to teach in the church. Uh, during this time in the Roman Empire, if you remember, uh, skilled orators were very highly um, regarded. These were the superstars of the culture. Uh, people who could think and speak impressively were lauded as cultural heroes. Um, remember the story of Paul in Athens from Acts 17, where he goes to the marketplace and he sees all of these idols, and he starts just debating with people. It seems like there were just these philosophers and orators just sort of milling around in the marketplace, willing to debate ideas all day long. Um, Paul just had to go and you know you just throw a rock anywhere in the marketplace, and you'll you'll hit somebody who's going to be willing to debate religion with you. Um, it's kind of like, you know, first century social media, first century Twitter or Facebook, um, you know, just find somebody and start an argument with them. Um, this was how people got famous and how, how they were highly regarded. These were the celebrities of the time. And super apostles, they claimed um, that Paul and his companions were acting according to human standards. Um, this is from chapter 10 now, uh, verse 2. And they said, if you judge Paul by human standards, um, Paul comes up short. Okay? Um, he's lacking in these areas, his, his rhetorical skill, his presence, his debating ability. Um, in chapter 10, verse 10, we get some of the criticisms leveled at Paul. And again, this is Paul himself um, reporting this, but and he's kind of putting words in the mouths of his opponents. In uh, 10 verse 10, he says, His letters are we weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So again, this is Paul s saying what his opponents say about him. And so kind of a weird way to read this, but um, yeah, you know, we, we get some of the criticism that these super apostles were leveling at Paul. Um, you know, yeah, he, he's just not a great speaker. He doesn't have a lot of charisma. Um, you know, yeah, you know, his bodily presence is weak. I don't know if that means that he was short or you know, that he maybe had a disability. But yeah, anyway, uh, they, they criticized kind of his, his presence and the way that he spoke. 
and, and they kind of made fun of it because he said they said you know oh when he's writing his letters he's really brave and, and he's very strong when he's writing but then when he comes in person then suddenly you know he, he's this awkward you know kind of weird guy and you know his his speech is contemptible um, second corinthians um suggests again that yeah paul was lacking in these skills and the super apostles were deriding him for it and maybe some in the corinthian church were being persuaded by these opponents um, again, you know, the, your celebrities are the people who can speak really well and have a really good presence. And so when the super apostles came in, maybe they were really great speakers and they were saying, hey, you need to listen to us. You need to follow us because we can, you know, we have all of this uh, skill and we have the, all these great arguments. And Paul, uh, you don't have to listen to him. Now, when this conflict happens, Paul's response is something very interesting. Um, instead of trying to kind of flex his debating skills or you know, make points and argue, hey, wait a second, I'm, a I'm actually a really good speaker. Don't listen to these people. Okay, Paul doubles down. He actually embraces this criticism. Um, in chapter 11, verse 6, he says, I may be untrained in speech, but not in knowledge. Certainly in every way and, and in all things, we have made this evident to you. <clears throat> so he's saying here, you know, um, I may be untrained in speech. My, uh, sure, okay, maybe I'm not a great speaker, but I have this knowledge. I have this authority to speak about these things to you. Okay, I, I, can, I can correct you. I can train you um, despite whatever awkwardness existed in his in his speech or, or however his maybe his preaching was lacking um, later on in that same chapter chapter 11 he says if I must boast I will boast of the things that show my weakness wow what, what is this guy talking about okay I must boast I will boast of the things that show my weakness um, but then of course this culminates in the famous text in um, 2nd Corinthians chapter 12 verses 9 and 10 uh, Paul says that he had this vision and he was actually taken up to heaven and he got these words from Jesus himself. He said, uh, Jesus spoke to me and he said, my grace is sufficient for you for power is made perfect in weakness. Goes on in verse 10, he says, so I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. All right. Um, Kind of saying that I'm not going to, uh, you know, rely on my own power, my own wit and skill, but I want to show the power of Christ. And if that is communicated best in weakness, then I'm all the more happy for it. All right, a very interesting response to some of these criticisms. But again, um, we, we know that this turned out pretty well. Second uh, Corinthians um, in the middle there, chapter 7, 8, 9, uh, does refer to uh, this reconciliation. Right? Uh, and that the Corinthians, you know, they, they kind of, yeah, where they started listening to Paul again. And uh, this, this relationship was restored. Uh, furthermore, in um, Romans chapter 16, we think that Romans was written after uh, both of these letters to the Corinthians. And um, in Romans 16, uh, we have this long list of people's names. All right. Um, I, I don't remember exactly how many, something like 33 names that are listed in Romans 16. And some of those people were church members in Corinth. Paul is actually passing greetings on to the Roman church from uh, some of these prominent church members in Corinth. And so apparently he is he is on good terms with these people again. If Romans was indeed written after uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, uh, Rome, the end of Romans indicates that, yeah, you know, this relationship actually did get restored. And uh, he was in communication with these people, and um, it was a good enough relationship that they said, hey, you know what, we, our friends in Rome, let's, you know, go ahead and pass our greetings on to them. Right. Um, apparently, Things did work out for the best. So what is the takeaway here to conclude? Okay. 
a lot of times you know we idolize you know the early church right we think that they were so unified and they were so on fire and the holy spirit was just working through them but in this kind of dialogue here between paul and the corinthians we learn really that the church there was very fallible okay and they had a lot of problems and difficulties a lot of issues to work through and a lot of them were the same issues that we deal with today uh divisions you know political kind of um you know uh, dealings people trying to get more influence um these super apostles come in and they're saying you know hey you don't have to listen to this guy you know don't listen to this pastor listen to this other pastor instead uh, the same kinds of things that our church deals with right now and the same kinds of things that we say you know this is bogging down our ministry uh this is compromising our witness well that's been happening for a long time okay um it even shows us that you know paul had some foibles too um he did get very impatient um he he did you know kind of say hey you know you need to listen to me and um, don't listen to anybody else and so you know yeah paul comes across in some parts of this as being kind of insecure um you know kind of i'm almost authoritarian in a lot of ways and so yeah you know even our great leaders in the church today they're going to have their faults and their their blind spots because we're all human and even this person that we call saint paul had some of those same weaknesses and foibles that he ends up boasting about <laughs> Um, and yeah, you know, maybe that's a good lesson for us in the way that we see our weaknesses. Can they be used um, for the purpose of ministry and to give glory to God and to Jesus? All right. Uh, so that's Second Corinthians. Have a look at this book. Okay, very interesting letter, um, and look at it, read it, maybe with some of these ideas in mind. And uh, next week, uh, I'm planning to pick up in uh, Romans one of Paul's most famous letters with a lot of interesting stuff and some very well-known uh, passages from there. All right, thank you very much for tuning in. And um, if all goes well, assuming my computer doesn't die again, um, have something uh, next week for you uh, in the Epistle of Romans. All right, uh, thanks a lot, and uh, take care until next time. Join us if you can.